Okay, great. So, yeah. Hello, everyone. This is the eighth edition of the Leighton AI Meetup. And this time we have uh, Claudio Gallicchio, assistant professor at University of Pisa in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, some of you have already talked with him, I know, like Ruben and Jonathan. And uh, for some others, it's a new thing. So he will be talking about uh, deep reservoir computing and beyond. And I leave the word to him. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Jacopo. And thanks for the nice words. And thanks, of course, for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here to um, tell you a little bit about what I do in my, in my research. Um, Okay, wait, just a moment, sorry. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, like, like Carvo said, I am a researcher at the um, Department of Computer Science in the University of Pisa. Uh, my, my topic of research is uh, about uh, recurrent neural networks and in particular reservoir computing and deep reservoir computing. Yeah, I indicated in the title of this uh, webinar and beyond because uh, I like to use the same concept also for um, other kinds of data processing like for example, machine learning for graphs, which is um, for structures in general, so also for trees, but in, the, in this presentation, I will show you some results that we have on graphs. And one question that I would like to ask perhaps to Jacopo before we start is how do we deal about the questions? For me, everything is fine. If you want to interrupt me while I, I'm presenting, it's okay. If you want to uh, ask me after, it's okay yeah, too. You... I, I, I think I don't see raised dance or something like that, right? Yeah, um, usually uh, we do that. If there is a question about clarifying something in the slides that is not very clear, we take it right away and like people are free to unmute themselves or uh, write in the chat and they will ask the, the question. Um, otherwise, for like open-ended question, we do a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. That's right. how we do usually. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so this is the major background, the major topic that I that I study during my, my research life. Okay. All right, so a, a little bit of, uh, let's say, co context. Um, a little bit of context, like I said. Uh, well, it, it's our, our life, more or less, it's all about uh, artificial neural networks and AI. We are here because we, we like, we are passionate about these topics. Um, and um, in, inside us that motivates us to, to, to do everything that we do day by day, there is this little idea that we want to try to reproduce what, what, what's possible uh, with our brain. So like the little idea, the, 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 the nice idea that we want to study and try to replicate the functionalities of the brain, that little piece of matter that is perhaps the most complicated things that we aim at studying. So automate all the possible intellectual tasks that are performed by humans in a natural fashion. Um, my perspective to this kind of study is more related to the computational neuroscience and computer science side, though there are other, other uh, perspectives to, to this study. So studying artificial neural networks like mathematical models used to approximate unknown functions from data. This is the general context. Okay, so when we talk about deep learning and deep neural networks in particular, we know that we are dealing with something that is able to develop multiple representations through nonlinear transformations of the input data. Um, in such a way, like for example, in this picture here, I hope you can see my 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 um, my pointer. Otherwise, please let me know. Like yes, we, we put, can. okay, thanks. We put our input data here in the left part of the of the in the input part of the in the input neuron of the of the neural network. We propagate this information through our um, layers, and then we uh, reach the last layer where we let's say the last hidden layer where we know that the representation 
of the initial data is much better for our task to be to be solved linearly. Okay, so the idea here in deep learning, one of the most important ideas in deep learning, we can say it's the ability to develop progressively richer representation of the input data so that we can solve our problem uh, with ease, let's say, in the last layer or in the developed representations. Okay. All right, so uh, what's the, the, the power in, in deep learning under this perspective, okay? I know for sure you, you, you would say, you can say, for example, hardware specific and ad hoc hardware and um, high performance computing hardware. And that's true. From, met from the methodological uh, aspect indeed, and instead, I can say that perhaps the three most important ingredients in my view are um, the architectures, the power of the architectures, the power of the training algorithms, the initialization schemes of these uh, deep neural networks. Uh, you could also write another line and indicate perhaps the um, activation functions, but maybe let, let's keep this out of the, of, the, of the picture for now, okay? Um, well, what I'm going to tell you today uh, removes from the equations the uh, training algorithm. So we study the what you can achieve with specific or purpose um, neural networks architectures and good initialization schemes. Um, and this is, let's say, a part of what we can call um, deep randomized neural networks, a topic that nowadays is gaining increasingly more interest in the neural networks community. And just like a little bit of uh, advertisement, uh, there is this book chapter that I wrote with my colleague Simone Scadapane from the University of Rome, in which we uh, attempt at giving an overview over the basic, ide basic ideas in this field of deep randomized neural networks. Okay, where well, we put this word randomized to indicate that we don't, don't apply learning to every part of the network. So we remove the training algorithms part from our um, consideration. Okay, so you can find this paper on archive and I guess you will have the, the, the slides after this, this webinar so you can have a look at it. And uh, for those of you who will participate to AAAI 21 this year, there will be um, a dedicated tutorial. So I will, I will give a tutorial on deep randomized neural networks in that conference. So I know that many of you um, have papers in NeurIPS. So great, congratulations to all of you. To some of you, I already congratulated myself. Uh, if some of you managed to participate to AAAI, we can meet each other again also there, okay? All right, so today I would like to talk about structured data. Okay, so data comes in structured forms in many ways. We are perhaps more used to consider images like the most important source of data sets for machine learning and deep learning applications. but structured data in the form of time series, for example, always occurs in many real world applications it's ubiquitous. Essentially, for example, when you consider the internet of things, so we have, for example, uh, an ambient intelligence scenario and we have the human inside this ambient intelligence scenario. We know that um, the interaction between the human and the sensorized environment determines a, a, a huge stream of data that we can make sense of using machine learning. Similarly, <clears throat> for the case of self-driving cars or let's say assisted driving cars, or if you want, for example, Dealing with a musical composition is another way, is another um, case in which you can, you can have a lot of time series data or when dealing with speech or text processing. But recently, the, okay, we know that we can apply machine learning and deep learning techniques, mostly in the, in the form of recurrent neural networks uh, in the case of time series. Um, more recently, there is this idea of uh, trying to use also uh, as source of input data, um, information that is encoded like graphs. Okay, so machine learning for graphs and deep learning for graphs is another major topic nowadays of development in machine learning and deep learning. So here the idea is that we, um, instead of having 
um, one information or let's say a vectorial information every time step. Okay, so we have several informations and these information are linked by the temporal structure. Uh, in the case of graphs data, we know that we have, let's say nodes or vert vertices and these are linked by edge relations. And this can, for example, model chemical compounds and we can define, we can try to or attempt to solve problems in, uh, in the case of, in the domain of chemical compounds, like for example, toxicology or uh, chemistry, um, but also from other areas like social, um, uh, human areas like um, social network analysis, uh, that it is ubiquitous as well, okay? So dealing with graphs uh, gives us a lot of opportunities, but also let's say gives us a lot of problems to be solved. All right, so the starting point in my discussion is uh, related to recurrent neural networks. We know um, most of the time in, in the current development of deep learning, we, we deal with convolutional neural networks that are, let's say, most suitable for dealing with um, data that, that is fixed in a sense, okay? So vectorial or um, grid form of data. Mm -hmm. When we deal with temporal data, we need to take into consideration the dynamics of the input. When we want to take into consideration the dynamics of the input, then we resort to recurrent neural networks. Basically, I'm sure that all of you know this, but just to frame the discussion, let's go ahead with this brief description. So let's say we have our time series here on the bottom of the slide. At each time step, we have our input, let's say XT, this input is, fed to our hidden layer. Our hidden layer, differently from the case of feedforward neural networks, contains a loop, okay? That gives dynamics and memory to the system. This means that the activation, so the neural code that is developed here in this hidden layer, denoted by, for example, HT and time step T, is a function of the input that is now arrived to the system and of the previous state, the previous hidden representation. Okay, so H at time step T depends on the input X at time step T and of H at time step T minus one. Okay, so the basic idea is that here I have some dynamics. Okay, so there are dynamics in the input and dynamics in the internal hidden layer representation. Uh, starting from this um, temporal changing representation that is provided by the hidden layer of this uh, architecture, we can we can put uh, an output layer that we call readout and we can compute the output function. Okay, for example, in time series classification, we can uh, attempt a classifying. So give the, the uh, class label of our time series in input. Okay, so the can, this is the vanilla form of recurrent neural networks. You can have much more complex, of course, um, versions, but at least, you have to implement this couple of equations. Okay, so where the first equation is the equation is the state transition function of our hidden layer. And the second equation is the function that is computed by the readout layer. And in particular, this HT is the state. It is a function of the input at the same time step and the state at the previous time step. Here I call this H the state because we can treat this like the state of a dynamical system. Mm. Um, and then once I have the state at time step t, I can compute the output uh, through a possibly nonlinear, but typically linear transformation of the, of the state, okay? All right, so these two transformations, the state transition function and the output function are tuned by, let's say are uh, parameterized by a number of, uh, let's say synaptic weights that are, uh, that are tuned based on, um, on the uh, on your data set that you want to fit okay so we have these three matrices basically input weight matrix recurrent weight matrix and the output weight matrix that contain the free tunable parameters of your system okay so when we when we um, employ in practice this kind of architectures uh, and we use to compute on a time series in input then we have the following the following organization, okay? So we said yellow is the input, the blue is the hidden representation and the, um, let's say the violet, the pink 
is the yeah the violet is the is the output okay so when i apply this for one time step then i apply my other information that is the loss function okay so i know um how the network how my system performed with respect to that time step okay um when my new input comes then i repeat exactly the same procedure for the second time step then for the third time step and so on and so forth so you can see in practice when i apply a recurrent neural network um controlling that over the time then what i achieve is essentially um a deep uh, architecture. So unrolling a recurrent neural network over time uh, gives me uh, something that is very similar to uh, a deep neural network. So also when I consider training in this case, I need to face similar difficulties. And one of the most known and well-studied problems is, the, is related to the gradient. Um, we know that when we want to, when we want to train this kind of architectures and neural networks in general, and you have more than one layer, then you can use the backpropagation algorithm. Then in this case, of course, it is called backpropagation through time. The, the idea is essentially the same. You want to propagate the gradient information that you might have, for example, here, back in time uh, until you re uh, reach the very first um, hidden representation that is being developed by your system. Okay, so this is... Um, this leads to a lot of problems like gradient vanishing or explode um, that can be tried to to be let's say in in, in a way can be can be um, overcome in, in a form or another by for example changing the the topology of your network by introducing gates mechanism mechanisms like in long short-term memory but um, in practice, in all the cases, you end up with this problem that training recurrent neural networks is low. Okay, is uh, on the one end it is low, on the other end it might require um, high performance computing support. Okay, so either you uh, accept the fact that that is low, or you need to use GPUs, for example, or other kinds of accelerators that you might have at your disposal. Uh, and also in this case, it might be it might be time com consuming as well. So in practice, you have problems when you want to train the recurrent neural network. So alternatives needs to be needs to be considered. Okay. One intriguing alternative is given by reservoir computing. In in the case of reservoir computing, what we do is we focus on the dynamical part of the recurrent neural network. Okay, so we focus here on this blue part. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea is that you study, you want to study this component of the system like a dynamical system, okay? So you study the recurrent the layer of a recurrent neural network like a discrete time nonlinear and non-autonomous non dynamical system. And yeah, I use, let's say, all definitions related to, non, um, to discrete time versions, but you can also consider continuous time dynamics as well. All right, so in this case, in practice, what we want to do is focusing on these equations for the state transition function, we want to find smart initialization of, of, the, uh, of the weights in this recurrent component, such that in practice, you can even use a randomized set of parameters that you can leave untrained after the initialization, okay? So the, the basic idea is that you, let's say, try to um, try to impose some, some properties to your dynamical system in order to be sure that your dynamical system will not, let's say, diverge or will not show chaotic, chaotic behavior. So, so will show a stable behavior asymptotically and still producing a rich representation of your input data. Okay, so we call this dynamical part, we call it the reservoir because it should resemble, let's say, a, a pool of dynamics. It should provide you a pool of dynamics. Even if it is randomized, it's a very large pool of dynamics from which you can combine uh, achieving something good, okay, in the read out part of the system. So the, 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 the cool part in this uh, reservoir computing is that we um, fix 
uh, randomly the parameters of, uh, of the reservoir, and we only train the output function. Okay, so in practice, this is much faster and lightweight to train with the speed up. Here I indicated more or less one, um, uh, 100. Okay, so in, in, in my practical, let's say, experiments when you deal with time series data sets, you can find out more or less this is the advantage when you, when you deal with reservoir computing instead of other alternatives when you fully train the entire architecture. But one of the other nice things is that this approach can be amenable to scale for, for example, edge distributed learning. So you want to embed um, the ability of treating time series data with a neural network. So you want to embed a recurrent neural network in your, let's say, uh, edge device, you can embed a reservoir computing system instead. Okay. Like I said, like I said before, reservoir computing, you can look at that. Um, from the perspective of uh, in, um, smart initialization of recurrent neural network. Normally, conventionally, when you train a um, uh, recurrent neural network, you need to, to apply learning to both of these two matrices here. Okay, so U, input weight matrix, and W, recurrent weight matrix. When you, <clears throat> when you go into this reservoir computing approach instead, um, one of the major messages is that indeed you can use randomized matrices U and W and instead scale the magnitude of the weights that you have in these two matrices, okay? So you, you go from tuning all the parameters to tuning only a few parameters, okay? So this omega and rho here, that let's say in a sense control the scaling of the of the um, of the weights in these matrices. Uh, are there perhaps questions here? There is one. Uh, you... Oh, okay, 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 okay. I see a question. I come in a second. Okay. Yeah. I come in a second. All right. So the idea here is that we we instead of tuning all the weights, essentially we can tune only the scaling, the magnitude of the weights inside the, the, this, um, this system. Uh, one thing you could do, for example, could be um, training these parameters, for example, using the propagation through time, if you want. Typically, this is not done. This is treated like a pro an optimization problem that is solved by searching the hyperparameter space. So you, you treat this omega and rho like hyperparameters of your system and you do, for example, uh, model selection, okay? Like with the grid search or random search or Bayesian search or whatever you prefer. But you, nothing, nothing says that you cannot do, for example, web propagation through time only on two numbers in this case, instead of, let's say, a number of quantities that scales quadratically with the size of your system. Okay, right, this is about the initialization. And to conclude in relation to initialization, so we can say, we randomly initialize these two weight matrices U, W. Uh, we can also exploit here sparse, sparse connectivity. Okay, so to let's say um, enable the use of sparse matrix multiplications that uh, make the computations faster. But how to scale these weight matrices? Okay, ideally, we need to, in a sense, fulfill what is called the echo state property in literature. And you can find here in the bottom of the slide, a nice paper that I suggest you to read. If you don't know it, it's really, it's really uh, amazing and describes this idea of the echo state property really in depth. The idea in, in few words of echo state property is that we want to ensure global asymptotic Lyapunov stability of this uh, state transition function. Okay, and this in practice, only in practice, not in theory, translates into a rescaling, okay, and control of the values of these two numbers here, in particular, this uh, blue number, the spec, the, uh, this number rho, that can be considered like um, a modulator for the spectral radius of the recurrent weight matrix. Okay, so we control this value, we initialize it with a value that is smaller than one and we fix it. Okay, so we fix all the weights and don't apply learning. 
Okay, you only apply learning through the readout. And coming to the question, how do you train the reservoir computing system on the edge? Well, um, there are several alternatives. Typically, mm, reservoir computing is, uh, in reservoir computing architectures, you train only the readout, okay? So only the output part of the system is trained. Yeah, the, the part in, in violet, only that part is trained. And as your problem, uh, when you need to train the readout is a uh, convex optimization problem, then um, in practice, um, sorry, I, I read another, another question. Yeah, the, the problem of optimization is convex. So, so you can use, for example, closed form solution. So you can apply Tigon of regularization um, and solve the problem of learning there very easily. When you are at the edge, what you can do, if you can, afford the inversion of matrices, then you can go with standard reservoir computing approaches, okay? So you can use, again, ridge regression. Um, if you can't go with that, you can, for example, apply um, alternatives to least, um, least mean squares algorithms, like recursive least squares algorithms. This is what we did in one of our previous European projects. So we implemented EcoState networks that are one kind of reservoir computing architectures in Telos B modes with a total number of eight kilobytes of RAM. And the network was really, really lightweight with a very small footprint. Uh, there we implemented the recursive least squares algorithm. So you can, for example, you can implement the system on these algorithms on, on uh, a very small device where you have some sensor data that is produced there. And you, let's say you can update your weights exactly there where they are produced, okay? Hope to, to get an insight, an, an insight, yeah. Um, the second question is, if it is possible to give an intuition to the Lyapun of stability. Um, okay, so in practice, the idea is that you have this um, this system, okay? So this system is done autonomous in the sense that the trajectory of your, of your state, the, the, the values of H of T uh, over time, okay? When, when T changes, okay? Depends um, also, depends also on the values of X, okay? So uh, the idea of the asymptotic in global Lyapunov stability in this case is that if I give a little perturbation to my input data, then the trajectory that the system needs to follow sh shouldn't change too much, okay? So ideally, if I give you a two time series and these two time series in input, of course, and these two time series are exactly the same, but at a certain point, one of those uh, contains a typo, let's say, then the effect of the typo perturbation in the state trajectory should vanish over time, okay? This is the basic idea. So that asymptotically, let's say, and after a transient period, the uh, all the possible trajectories of my system, given, given, uh, given a, a very similar input should converge to the same trajectory. I hope. I hope this is at least a little clear. Okay. Okay. All right. So, and now to ensure this, there are nice properties and nice theoretical analysis that you can find in this paper, for example, or reviewed at least in this paper uh, that give an intuition on how to, to set up the weights of the metrics in order to, to have this kind of stability uh, in many cases. <clears throat> okay, so the trade-off is between expressivity of your system, so separability of the possible input time series and robustness to perturbations. So you don't want that the system given to very similar inputs gives you completely different trajectories of your reservoir. Mm -hmm. But you at, you at the same time want to be able to have different trajectories for different time series. Okay, so another nice perspective to see why does this work in practice uh, has been studied in a number of works on Markovian, um, on, on the Markovian bias of recurrent neural networks. So this is 
Uh, there are a number of works and without any bias here, I have indicated my work that you can find on neural networks. Um, well, the basic uh, outcome of this strand of studies is that you can see if you initialize your uh, dynamical reservoir system to be stable, mm, in practice, you are developing a system that uh, constructs, let's say, the state, where the state at least, okay, is constructed in a suffix-based fashion. What does this mean? This means that if I have two input time series that share the same common suffix, here, for example, is a common suffix of length like two, then the state in which these two time series are mapped, for example, is these two, so very close. If I have indeed uh, other two time series, let's say the second and the third with different, um, with different um, suffixes, Okay, so these two are mapped into two very distant points in the state space. So in practice, uh, even without learning, I can exploit this uh, Markovian bias of recurrent neural systems mm, to discriminate between input time series based on the suffix. Okay, so if my problem, uh, the problem that I want to solve is, um, let's say, in line with this kind of organization of the state space that the reservoir computing gives me, then fine. I can use reservoir computing neural networks without learning of recurrent connections. It's fine. Okay, so I can solve my problem and I am satisfied with that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if my problem, let's say, is um, contrary to this Markovian suffix based organization of the state space, then I might have problems in, in using reservoir computing systems. <clears throat> okay, so in the, this basic approach has a number of advantages. Of course, it is faster to learn an ecostate network or reservoir computing system because actually you are not training a large part of your architecture. Another interesting thing is that it, it lends itself to clean mathematical analysis. For example, in relation to what I said before, in relation to the architectural bias of recurrent neural networks. And here you can see a nice paper, quite old actually, but really informative about this topic. Uh, and third, uh, among others, uh, it's amenable to implementations, for example, in unconventional artwork that exploits, for, for example, photonics. And of course, many of you are familiar with this concept. Okay, so, um, and it, it's nice also that there is, there can be a lot of cross pollination between all of these aspects. Okay, even considering just a cost of networks, it, it's nice to see that from a computer science perspective, there is some uh, specific point of view that is, let's say, um, that can give an insight to the engineers or physicists and vice versa. So I find that this part of the of the of the community uh, around reservoir computing is um, is very nice also for this for this let's say diversity of backgrounds that can give to very nice cross pollination of ideas. All right, um, in this slide I need to 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 tell you about a little bit about our past experience in applications, in real world applications of of reservoir computing systems and ecostate networks. And I mentioned a few projects in which we have used um, ecostate networks, for example, for ambient intelligence or human activity recognition and robot localization in hospitals. And all of these things were done uh, with the, within the, the, the scopes of this FP7 European project Rubicon. Um, other aspects in which we have used or are using these ecostate networks are in relation to, for example, early identification of earthquakes um, from sensor data, or other areas are related to medical applications like estimation of clinical exams outcomes, like exams related to the balance skills of individuals. Um, that might allow you, allow you, for example, to follow up the post-surgical development of, a, of, a, of, a, of an individual after the surgery um, from his house. Um, also, interestingly, early identification of rare uh, head diseases, and this is something that we are still developing in a project, uh, Italian project that is called BRAID. Um, and also I would like 
at least to spend a few words about these human-centric interactions in cyber-physical systems of systems. That is uh, a work that we conduct within the scopes of this uh, H2020 European project called Teaching. In this project, in practice, we aim at putting, let's say, um, the human in the loop inside the cyber physical systems, like for example, autonomous vehicles or uh, self-driving cars, let's say, or even in the case of avionics, though a little bit reduced uh, in that case. So here, for example, we want to gather information from the sensors that are either worn by the user or inside the car. We, um, let's say, use in this case federated a system of federated uh, reservoir computing and neural networks to, let's say, give or to understand human feedback in order to personalize, for example, the driving style or other kind of services that the human might experience when uh, being part of these cyber physical systems of systems. <clears throat> All right. And another nice thing of, uh, about this reservoir computing is that actually to implement all that you need is really very simple. You can just, you, you, you need really a few, a few dozens of lines of code. And if you want to have a look at my implementation of deep ecosystem networks, I'm talking in a, in a moment about that. You can have a look, for example, to my GitHub and have a look at my TensorFlow 2 implementation in Keras, you can use it instead of a standard uh, get it recurrent unit cell or LSTM cell or uh, RNN cell in Keras, if you use that. <clears throat> okay, so um, what happens when we move to, uh, to deep architectures? Okay, uh, the concept of deep recurrent neural network um, is a little bit debated in, 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 in literature. Uh, like I showed you before, when you unroll a recurrent neural network over time, then you achieve uh, a deep architecture. Okay, so when you unroll the uh, recurrent neural network, you have a, a deep network. But instead, indeed, actually, when you, when you look at the transitions uh, in, in a recurrent neural networks, all the transitions are indeed shallow. Okay, so it is nice and interesting to study the possibility of having, or let's say, the, 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 the possibilities that the architectures in which you stack multiple layers of recurrent units can give you. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we consider the recurrent um, architectures, let's say, when the recurrent component is a stat composition of multiple reservoirs. Mm -hmm. So in practice, we start from the, from the shallow case where we have the input XT, the yellow box that feeds the first reservoir, the first dynamical reservoir. So in practice, this input is driving the dynamics in this layer, okay? So the equations that we had before. Then we put another reservoir on top of that. So we consider the output of the first reservoir layer, and we consider this like the input that drives the dynamics of the second reservoir that we have. So here, if we look at this H1T, that is the state of the first reservoir, this become the input for the second layer in my reservoir, okay? And I can continue in this way until I reach my last layer in the architecture, okay? So in practice, I drive the upper layer dynamics using the uh, dynamics provided by the lower layer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and after that, I can uh, plug in a readout layer that combines all of these, all of these dynamics that are developed in the different layers together. Okay, for example, okay, the aim, the general aim is that I, I diversify automatically the, uh, the quality of these dynamics. Then if I put a readout there, I can automatically combine. Mm, uh, based on, on, my, on my target information, I can weight differently, the different quali qualitatively different dynamics that I have developed in the different layers. Okay, and the cool thing is that all of the, uh, of the weight matrices that you can have in this case, uh, so U1, W1, U2, W2, and so on and so forth, all, all of those can be fixed beforehand. So you don't need to apply learning 
Mm -hmm. You just study this uh, set of equations, like a, a set of nested dynamical systems, okay? When the dynamics of a system are those that determine the dynamics of the next system in the pipeline and so on until you reach the end of the, of the, of the architecture. So uh, you can derive uh, global asymptotic stability conditions also in this case, and you can find the uh, theoretical results in this paper that I published on cognitive computation some years ago. Okay, um, so um, one nice thing about this kind of architecture in my view is that uh, it, it can allow you, for example, uh, a clean mathematical analysis of uh, deep recurrent neural networks. So what happens, wh what happens when I stack a multiple uh, set of layers of recurrent layers, one on top of each other. So what happens when I have a stacked composition of uh, untrained dynamical systems? Mm. Um, in literature, there has been a quite number of studies that show that there is some quality that you can have. For example, you, you can find that you are able to develop multiple time scales and multiple frequencies. In the, in the different layers of the architectures. Our perspective, let's say, um, and our studies, initially at least, were motivated by the fact that uh, indeed, we, we, we saw that uh, all of these qualities that you can have stacking multiple layers of recurrent uh, layers is not related to the training algorithms, but it is indeed related to the um, layer, the recurrent architecture. So the dynamics, that you are giving to your system because the same amount of recurrent units is not organized in one single shallow layer, but it is organized in multiple layers. Mm -hmm. So we did a number of experiments that were published in the early works, 2017, 2018, that show essentially these intrinsic properties of, uh, let's say, this uh, bias of depth in recurrent neural networks architecture. So even if you don't apply learning in, um, in the recurrent connections in a deep recurrent neural network, then you can have multiple time scales, multiple frequency, and also you can have a richer dynamics uh, in, in higher layers. What I mean by richer dynamics, I mean, richness can be measured in, in a lot of ways. For example, if you consider the the, state, the 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 average state entropy of your of your system, mm -hmm. so you compute the um, in a sense you can compute the the, the entropy of your of your state uh, at each time step, and then you can average uh, for all the time steps. Mm -hmm. So you can see that actually you can have um, a richer, in this sense, system. So for example, with the higher value of this average state entropy in the higher layers of the architecture. And this indeed is related to the architectural choices. So the scaling parameters that you can have in your system. Here, for example, you can see a plot of a paper on which I'm still working, which shows that, for example, by changing the magnitudes of the weights in the, um, in, in the connections between two consecutive reservoir layers, then you can affect the richness of the developed representations for increasing layers. So for very small values of the connections between two, con two consecutive layers, then you can see there is a progressive, let's say progressively more poor dynamics are developed. But instead, when you have sufficiently large values of this scaling, parameters, then you can see that you have uh, progressively better and more rich dynamics in the upper layer. So here, for example, you see the average state entropy um, or the uh, intrinsic dimensionality. You recall these linear and un uncorrelated dimensions of the reservoir state space uh, and other similar considerations. <clears throat> All right, another way in which you can, in, a, in which you can um, compute in a sense or measure the richness of your, of your dynamical system is, for example, um, assessing how close it is to the so-called edge of chaos. Okay, so you know a system, a dynamical system may be in a stable regime or in unstable regime, even in a chaotic regime. 
Okay, so um, one thing that you can do numerically is computing its maximum local Lyapunov exponent. So if this number is close to zero, but it is negative, it means that your system is stable, but close to be unstable. So in this region, let's say when, when this value lambda max is close to zero from below, then you know that your system is in a rich region of dynamics. Okay, and one nice thing that we that we uh, showed um, in one of our papers is that actually you consider the same hyperparameterization of your system. You consider the same amount of recurrent units mm, in, in your reservoir, but you can distinguish two cases. One is the shallow case when all the uh, all the recurrent units are in the same layer, and this is the uh, orange line in the plot. And the other case is when uh, your uh, recurrent units are organized in a deep architecture. So you have a deep reservoir computing in that case. Hmm? So what you can see in the plot is that actually without adding anything else that layering in your architecture, automatically the maximum local Lyapunov exponents goes closer to zero. Okay, so this is a good thing on the one end because it says that you can have potentially richer dynamics. It's also a more dangerous, okay? It's also a dangerous thing because you can see that it is possible that the system becomes chaotic in a, let's say, more easily than a shallow system. Okay, and uh, okay, all of these can be uh, used in applications. And for example, one nice thing is that the system that this kind of reservoir computing neural networks are so easy to implement and to, to train that you can explore effectively the hyperparameter space. And indeed, you can see that uh, even in very complex uh, problems on time series, like these two that I indicate here, uh, that are um, polyphonic, uh, polyphonic music composition problems. Okay, so you, in practice here, you have a music composition. Uh, the piano roll of, of a music of a, of a polyphonic music composition, and you want to predict uh, the next the next uh, state of your piano roll. Okay, so the next set of notes that needs to be played. Okay, so it, it, this slide is just to to indicate you that you can even outperform the the the, the performance of long short term memory or gated recurrent units. But the nice point is not just that you can outperform those. That's because, I mean, you can find easily a good, a good configuration of your system. It's nice also the fact that the computation time that you need to train a deep echo step network, in that case, if, uh, even outperforming a gated recurrent unit, for example, is of order of magnitudes faster. Okay, so you can achieve a very good performance in a very small computational time. All right. So now coming to the last part of my of my um, of my talk, I would like to to come to the aspect of graphs. Okay, so in literature you can perhaps you can find a, two or three papers in which I extended the concept of reservoir computing from the case of time series to the case of trees. Mm -hmm. Uh, a tree, for example, can be used if you want to um, deal with a document. Mm. So you have a, your document, you consider the past tree of your document, and then you feed this tree to a neural network, you, for example, for classification. Um, in this case, we have a few times, so I, I, I just jump to the case of graphs. For the case of graphs, um, well, this is very cool in my, idea, in my opinion, because you can solve a lot of interesting problems, or at least you can approach a lot of interesting problems. Um, now your input is no longer a time series. Your input is a graph. And for example, your input can represent a molecule or a chemical compound that is produced by a, a, the industry. So um, your industry doesn't want to run the entire process of verification um, of the compound and maybe at least for an initial screening, you can give the structure of your compound in input to a deep neural network to uh, have in output an, an assessment, let's say, or an estimation of the degree of toxicity of your, of your molecule, okay? Or for example, if you are, if you are developing a, a drug, okay? And you want to know, you want to estimate the effectiveness of a drug 
to cure some kind of disease. Mm? Okay, so only given the structure of your molecule. And this structure of the molecule, of course, can be represented, for example, by a graph, where the vertices of the graphs represents the atoms, mm? and the bonds in the molecules are, are represented by the edges in the graph. Okay, so um, how do we use this kind of reservoir computing trick in the case of in the case of graphs? The basic idea is still that one of dynamical system that are stable that I mentioned all the time during this presentation. Okay, so I have my input graph. My input graph, in a sense, should be the external input hmm, that drives the dynamics of my system. Okay, so in a sense, I try to encode my each graph that I have, so I try to encode my graph into the fixed point of a dynamical system. Okay, and this dynamical system is implemented by the hidden layer of uh, a, a set of recurrent reservoir layers. Okay, so why do I want to use reservoir computing here? Of course, because it's faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, it it's, has, has a lot of properties, but now here, when you deal with molecules, when you deal with social network data, you have very big, uh, very big input information. So you want to be faster if possible. Okay, so this goes in the direction of developing faster um, deep neural networks for graphs. Okay, so let's see how does this work. Okay, how, how the concept of a dynamical, um, let's say, um, processes that we have seen until now applies in the case of graphs. Um, just close your eyes, think, think about this. We, are, um, we, we used to deal with time series, which means that we had, like I said, we had temporal relation between the input information. <clears throat> and we compute something for each time step. So we computed a state or a representation with our hidden layer for every time step. And we computed at each time step our representation based on the representation that we had computed for the previous time step. So now, in, in two words, the concept of time step is replaced by the concept of the vertex of the graph. So we want to compute a state or a representation or an embedding for every vertex in our graph. First thing. Second thing we uh, replace the concept of previous time step with the concept of neighborhood of your, of your vertex. So for every vertex, I need to compute a state or an embedding mm, that depends not on the previous time step, but depends on the state that I compute on the vertices, on the vertices that are in the neighborhood of my vertex. Mm. So here in the slide, you see vertex V and vertices V1, V2, up to VK. So I compute in practice, there is this kind of propagation of information. I compute a state or an embedding HV that depends on the input, XV, and the states H1 until H, uh, sorry, HV1 until HVK. Okay, so here, for example, uh, what, what, what can be the in input information that is attached to, to a vertex V? Can be, for example, in the case of molecules, it can be the, uh, an encoding of the input. If this were, for example, um, graphs representing social networks, it could be a description of a, a specific uh, identity in my social network. Okay. In the case of molecules, like I said, it can be a representation of the type of atom that that vertex represents. Okay. And in formulas, in practice, you have this kind of this kind of representation that is a generalization of the reservoir equation that I showed some slides ago. Where in, practi in practice, you can identify again, the embedding or the state for vertex V that is a function of the input feature for vertex V and the embedding or state of the neighbors uh, in the, uh, of the neighbors of vertex V. Okay, so you see here, there is this summation that runs for all the elements in the neighborhood of V. Okay, all right, uh, and this um, is uh, parameterized by a couple of uh, weight matrices, an input weight matrix and a hidden weight matrix, like in the case of reservoir computing. Cool, so we can um, collectively group all of these equations together. So for every graph, instead of 
representing this equation vertex-wise, we can collectively represent this equation graph-wise. Mm -hmm. So instead of having um, the state for every vertex, I, for example, column-wise, um, concatenate all, all of these, um, all, all of the states for all the vertices inside this tensor or matrix H. Okay, so this is my state. Uh, the, this X is my input feature matrix, and this A is the adjacency matrix that gives the structure, okay, of the input. So if you, you, you see it's just algebraic manipulations, you can go from this equation, from a set of this equation to this equation. Now, the cool part is that the, uh, this is a recurrence equation. Okay, so existence and uniqueness of the solutions um, is not guaranteed always. It depends on the structure of, um, of your graph. Okay, so for example, in the case of mutual dependencies between the vertices, like I say, for example, the, the state of vertex V depends on the state of vertex V1. And the state of vertex V1 depends on the state of vertex V. So this is one example hmm, of mutual dependencies. Um, then in that case, you cannot, you, you not always uh, are ensure to have existence and uniqueness of solution. How to um, enforce this existence and uniqueness of solution? But well, you can study this equation like exactly a discrete time dynamical system like we have seen before in the case of uh, time series reservoir computing. And so you can, um, let's say, enforce the existence and uniqueness of solutions studying the local asymptotic stability of this equation. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, one thing that we did recently is introducing this uh, asymptotic stability of the encoding process for graphs that we call the graph embedding stability property. Okay, so the, the, the main outcome is like in the case of ecostate networks, you just initialize your dynamics under these conditions. And to do this, it's very simple because you just need to um, study the, the eigenvalues of this recurrent weight matrix W, and then you leave it untrained. Okay, so this, this is in a sense what we did when we introduced the concept of reservoir computing for graphs. Right, so in this paper that um, I presented some months ago, almost a year ago nowadays, in AAAI 2020, um, we presented a deep architecture based on reservoir computing for graphs insights that I tried to, to convey you in this in these few slides, okay? So the basic idea is that we have multiple set of layers that work in this way, uh, one on top of, the, of each other, okay? So in practice, in the first, sorry, in the first hidden layer, I have my input graph that drives the dynamics of my dynamical system. I, uh, uh, let's say, I iterate the state transition equation of that uh, graph reservoir layer until until, oh, sorry. Sorry, I see there are, there are a number of questions. So I'm going to that very soon. Um, so you iterate the, the equations of the first layer until you reach your fixed point. Then you use that fixed point to drive the uh, dynamics of the second layer and so on and so forth until you reach the last layer in your architecture, okay? All right, so in practice, you have a pipeline of let's say isomorphic structures where the only thing that changes is the state that you have computed for every vertex. When you are in the last layer, what you do, you just apply a very simple uh, aggregation or pooling of your, of your vertex information, state vertex information, like some pooling in this paper. Then you apply a dense linear layer and you, uh, I mean, this is the output computation. So where the output sorry, where, uh, where the training um, applies, okay? Only in this part of the, of, the, of the architecture, okay? All the other part of the architectures are, are, uh, is left untrained. Mm -hmm. So it's very cool because in practice, in the experiments that we showed in this paper, uh, all of the weights were, were, were left untrained after the initialization and the only 
100 or 1000 in the largest experiments um, of weights in the output layer were trained. Okay, so the maximum number of free trainable parameters was 1000. Okay, it's very small compared to state of the art um, alternatives. Okay, and you can see, yeah, actually um, the performance that you can achieve with these systems is really very accurate. And in many cases, it, it even outperforms the state of the art results that you that you can you can find in literature. And that's I think it's really it's really it's really um, an interesting result because it's mostly based on an encoding process where you apply no any kind of learning. So even if you are doing this kind of learning free embedding of the graphs, this is so powerful that you even learning only the output function, you can achieve a very impressive result in practice. Okay. Um, so, okay, not only it is accurate, but it's also very fast as it is not adapted in the recurrent part. We run experiments uh, against uh, some of the state of the art um, state-of-the-art uh, algorithms in, in uh, deep neural networks for graphs. And we can see that we can have up to 1,000 um, magnitude of speed up in comparison, for example, of gene. Okay, but in nicely, it can it, it is fast. But if you think about that, it can even be faster if you introduce the concept of pooling in the case of graphs. Okay, so one, one nice thing on which we, um, I'm, I'm currently working is understanding and characterizing upper bounds to the, um, let's say, to the time that you need to get com convergence to the, to the fixed point of your dynamical system. Okay, um, when you introduce pooling in the, in the, between one uh, graph uh, layer, graph reservoir layer and another, then you essentially are reducing your um, your uh, adjacent symmetrics. Okay, you're, you're using a, you are um, changing to a very smaller um, and denser, let's say, weight matrix that influences the number of iterations that you need to get to convergence. Okay, and we 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 are trying to prove this formally. Oh, because in practice we already have seen that there is a nice trade-off between performance and time that you need to that you need to to achieve your results. Okay, so um, perhaps I can try to to draw very quickly the conclusion and go to the question soon after that. Um, all right, so deep reservoir computing is a nice way to enable effective learning in structured domains, both time series. Uh, trees and graphs, okay? Um, effective and fast. One of the things that I like is that this uh, also uh, enables to uh, highlight and to study and perhaps to even, even more uh, push you uh, the inherent positive architectural bias of recursive neural networks on structures, okay? Time series, trees or graphs. So what you can do with a recurrent based architecture, mm, uh, even before learning of the recurrent connections. And also it, let's say, stresses the, the good qualities and the, the, the positive um, aspects given by stability in deep recurrent neural networks. So stable architectures for deep learning is another uh, odd topic in, in machine learning research, mostly in convolutional neural networks actually. And of course, why you want to use this because it is accurate, both accurate and very fast. Okay, so this concludes my presentation and I, and I uh, thank you a lot for your attention. Um, maybe before, before to conclude, if you, if you agree, I can address the questions that I see in the chat. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Claudio, for the presentation. And yes, we can go right to the questions. Uh, I can ask them directly mm -hmm. to you. Okay, okay. Let me, let me turn on the camera now. Yeah. Hi. So there are two questions from Daniel Elliott. Uh, thanks you for the talk. And the first one is, um, 
When he attempts to use uh, server computing in real world application, he frequently runs into a problem of needing a lengthy time series to fill the reservoir, let's say. And he asks if this situation has improved since the initial work on, on reservoir computing. Okay, thanks for the question. This is a nice, quest nice question. Well, when you, <clears throat> actually, when you need to do that, uh, I, I guess this is related to the transient or the washout of the reservoirs, right? Um, well, I can, I can tell you what I do, indeed. Um, what I do is the following. When I know that I have to apply reservoir or my, a machine learning model to a very small time series, well, in that case, I don't use reservoir computing. It's my, my, my point of view, okay, my perspective. Um, we, we did something in, in previous works, like, for example, replicating the same input more times, okay? So you have, for example, a time, a time series of length n, n is very small, you replicate n many times. Mm -hmm. um, and on one end, okay, th this works in practice. Mm -hmm. And th th this works because let's say, uh, the, thing, the, all, the only thing that you need is to ensure that your system now is locked to the, um, to, the, uh, to the attractor trajectory, okay? So that, um, that all, of, all of the, let's say, all of the transient dynamics uh, died out. Mm -hmm. um, so in practice, this is also related to the um, stability property. You can have a look at my, one of my recent papers is called Chasing the Echo State Property. This, is, this gives a nice practical perspective, I guess, on this topic. Um, so also you can see if you need or not need to, 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 to discard the transcend in your practical case. Okay, I hope this can help in, in the usage. So, but if you, if you deal with very small, very, very small time series, well, in that case, I think that this kind of, this kind of architectures could not be the best thing to, 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 to use. And indeed, perhaps you don't need even recurrent neural networks at all in that case. Thanks. And the other question. Ah, sorry, sorry. Just yeah. to just to compliment right. it to to, to 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 give another another little piece of things. Uh, e, e, interestingly, that that is um, that actually the fact that you have to to discard the initial transient is related to the fact that you in the initial transient you don't have any. Uh, actually, you don't you cannot have any supervision. Mm. So the supervision is pointless there. Uh, but if you use output feedback connections, then your then your situation should should change drastically and should change in a, to a better situation. So one other suggestion to get, that I can give you is put uh, output feedback connections. In that case, even in the in the initial parts of the of the system of the time series, you should be able to modify the dynamics in a good way. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, sorry, the, the, the output layer in a good way. Yeah, the, the second question always by Daniel is, uh, do you have analysis showing that the stacked reservoirs capture increasingly higher level dynamics in the system? Yes. Um, okay, the paper that you might want to read in this case, let me go fast. Okay. Well, actually, the, um, these two papers here. Okay, this first paper on neural computing in, in 2017 and the next year, 2018, on neural networks. Yeah, we show exactly this, this, uh, this, this fact that the stacked reservoir capture increasingly higher layer dynamics. Thanks, and this is an easy one. <laughs> Bogdan asks if you have your code for graph neural networks published on GitHub. Oh well, no, 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 not on GitHub. Actually, um, that is that was not done in uh, in TensorFlow. We used to to do the, that code in MATLAB, indeed, where we could exploit a lot 
the, the um, sparse matrix multiplications indeed. Uh, so if you go in the, in that case, if you go, even in my webpage, you can find the code for that case. So, but if you go in this paper, have a look at this paper, it is reported the, the repository where it is implemented. You can download, but that, that's MATLAB. One of the next thing that I'm going to do, of course, is to, to give TensorFlow to implementation of the graph reservoirs. Great. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll put the link in the meetup page too. And yeah, there is a question by Felix. So only randomizing weights and respective scalars instead of learning them seems like a limitation upper bound on the complexity of tasks, but you have indicated that deep reservoir computing cannot perform LSTMs in certain scenarios. Uh, can you try to retrace this circumstance? Do you think this shares a connection to the general strength of random sampling or other Markovian bias? Or do you think that more focused gradient-free methods like genetic algorithms could improve convergence? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Great. Yeah, well, actually, I can say yes to all of your questions except the one, the first one, which is not yes or no. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, these two things. First of all, the. Let me go. Yeah. Um, there are two things that you have to, con that you might want to consider. Um, one thing is the architectural bias. Mm -hmm. So in the case of architectural bias, that is, let's say in a sense, ex extended in the case of deep reservoirs, um, then you know that if your problem is in line with this ar architectural, sorry, suffix-based organization of the state space at different degrees in the different layers, in the case of deep neural networks, um, well, then you can use in practice deep reservoir computing and that works like a charm, okay? For example, we used a lot of reservoir computing in applications that involve sensorial data. This, this kind of sensorial data in applications like these ones, this kind of applications involve sensor data. And in the case of sensor data, typically, at least in this kind of applications, you have mm, a kind of agreement with this Markovian bias. Okay, so when I have to localize a human inside an environment, it is of course clear that the trajectory that the human is following um, depends on the recent, uh, let's say, measurements mm? more than on the very past measurements in the in the, in the far past. Okay, so um, like also for example, when I'm doing something that relates to medical applications, this is typically the case. Not always, but typically the case. Um, when you deal, for example, with language, that's not always the case indeed. And that's why I think that applying this kind of architectures to language problems, it's not at least in, 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 the, in the simple case that I introduced, introduced you is not the very best thing that you can do. Okay, in the case of when you want to, when you, when you, when you want to for example, answer a question perhaps, or you want to understand the polarity of a sentence, no? then perhaps the first word could be more important than the last word. Mm. So in that case, these kind of tasks, perhaps using recurrent neural networks in, of this form is not the best solution. Um, so did I answer more or less all of those? Do I think that more focused gradient free methods like genetic algorithms can improve convergence well, yes, and can improve also the performance. Yeah, the other things, okay, the one, one thing was the, the, um, the Markovian bias. The other thing is that I can explore effectively the hyperparameter space. Um, so you can simplify even more the architecture. Here you have, let's say, these two numbers, but these two numbers, if you give a specific topology in the input weight matrix, if you give a specific topology to the to the recurrent weight matrix, like for example, I give you an, um, a permutation matrix instead of a 
dense or sparse matrix. Uh, in that case, you have only one number to describe the uh, entire recurrent weight matrix and one number to describe the entire input weight matrix. If you make this deep, you have another number to describe the interlayer weight matrix. And that's all, you have three numbers. So you can explore three numbers quite effectively. So this is another component of the fact that let's say you can achieve a very good performance because you can explore easily the, the hyperparameter space. Uh, okay, so I, I think that gradient free methods could be, could be good in this case. I expect also, actually, now we are working with, with one of my PhD students in actually learning a kind of spectral radius, let's say, in a different way, in, in any case, but let's say adapting hmm, the, these hyperparameters over time. The, this, um, this is another also very nice strand of research that is, let's say, in a sense, orthogonal to the... To the um, to the uh, genetic algorithms one. Great, thanks for the answers. And there is a question by Ruben. <laughs> Do you have any heuristic to choose the different variances of the different reservoirs in deep reservoir computing? And do they correspond to a multi-scale frequency analysis of the time series? Okay, thanks for the question, of course. Yeah, the last the, the last answer, the, uh, the last question, sorry, the answer is yes. Um, there is a nice uh, analysis of, of this as of this topic that we did in our 2018 paper. Let me go there. Yeah, the cool part of the animations is that when you when you want to go straight to one slide, it's a mess. Okay. Well. Uh, I can answer you in this way. We have seen, and you can see in this paper, much more in-depth analysis. Um, we have seen, and you have seen that when you apply a reservoir layer to your input data, then you are actually filtering a part of the frequency content. Typically, you are doing, a, you, are, you are cutting the, the uh, IF frequencies. Um, so when you stack multiple layers, in practice, what you do is restricting and focusing more and more on the, let's say, left part of the of the of the spectrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one, one cool thing that I think we did in this paper is uh, an automatic algorithm to stop the 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 create the construction of your deep neural network. Okay. So you can continue to stack multiple layers, analyze the frequency until you reach a point where you, where you are, let's say, chasing an asymptote, or you, let's say, have no, no, no anything else to, to, to cut. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you can stop the construction. And you are providing a diversified, a diversified, um, a diversified uh, representation from the frequency content to your readout, from which you can linearly combine. Mm. Uh, well, if you if you want to if you want to say instead, um, do I? Yeah, one, one other thing you could do potentially is uh, let's say cre changing the these hyperparameters in order to achieve specific specific range of frequencies in your reservoir. Okay. Well, uh, personally, I don't know if I would do that. Because if I want to, if I know, for example, that in my that in my application, I need to uh, have a system uh, that goes with specific uh, frequency mm, or a specific range of frequency, then I can have other means of doing that. Mm. But the cool part of deep reservoir computing is this comes for free. You don't have to go too much into the into the into the uh, let's say. Uh, into the way in which you are going to, to, to select a specific range of frequencies. You are automatically changing the range of frequencies in which your, in which your layers are, are working. But I, I feel that there is a lot of space for further works in this direction too. Sorry, maybe I take too long in answering. No, no the, questions are, uh, the questions are stimulating. 
Thanks for the answer. Uh, I don't see any other question in the chat. So I hope I read them all. Uh, are there any other questions? If you want to unmute yourself and ask them, you should be free to do so. Otherwise, I'm going to ask a question. OK, there is silence. I'm going to ask my question. Um, this is uh, all very fascinating. Um, it's kind of uh, connected to like RNNs and LSTMs that used to be the go-to choice for uh, many applications and for some they still are. But for some they, they've been like replaced by transformers, right? And I'm wondering if they're like, I've seen work on randomized transformers with the tension mechanism that becomes like a random matrix or fixed yeah. pattern or something similar. And I'm wondering if there is a frame, a way to frame that work similarly to the preserver computing, at least in like sequence to sequence uh, tasks, for example, that to allow either to have like more efficient models because at that point you have a like, randomized system and you don't have to learn like literally a lot of parameters there, probably much more than STM. Um, and also on the other hand, to have uh, like a more clear theoretical analysis of what is going on. I don't know if you've thought about this. Well, um, I'm pretty sure that these kind of randomized transformers are, I'm not, really sure they are already there. But I guess I have read something at least on archive about that. So um, could be a really nice topic to 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 develop in my in my view. And there are also of course many ways in you, in which you can let's say compose um, the randomization based algorithms with the fully trained based algorithms too. So you can compose a recurrent neural network with a transformer. And, but coming to your question, well, I, I think this is, this is still, this still needs to, to be developed in, in, in an in-depth way. So it's a cool stimulation for possible future works. And I think we are already there, almost there, but still not there. Um, a, a final thing I would like to say is that this is all about randomization now, but typically you see reservoir computing versus long short term memory or versus convolution neural networks or versus all the other things. You know? Sometimes you can see, you can use, for example, attention plus reservoir computing, for example. But I almost never see reservoir computing plus uh, gated recurrent units plus long short term memory. Um, one thing that I'm doing now is, for example, using reservoir computers like preprocessors for all of the things that you might have in mind and apply on top of that. Okay, so in full, fully unsupervised way, deep reservoir computing can give you, let's say, uh, all of the memory that you might need. And then on, the, on top of that, you can learn even less. Okay, for example, stuck on top of a deep reservoir layer, you can, you can plug uh, gated recurrent units where, with, with a much lower dimensional state than you would need in case you, without the reservoir computing below that. So I think this is very simple, simple approach. But uh, I think that combinations of architectural, architectural combinations of reservoirs and other kind of trained systems can show a lot of potential. Even think about the fed federated learning where you have heterogeneous systems. Some of those uh, learn only in some part of the architecture. Some of those uh, learn in the entire part of the architectures where, for example, on the cloud, you can learn um, <clears throat> the fully trained ar architectures. On the edge, you can, you can learn a subset of the weights and you then combine everything together in, in an aggregator. I, I mean, there is a space also for this kind of this kind of analysis. Yeah. Uh, well, this is what self-posed question. <laughs> okay. T totally agree. Uh, are there any other questions? Otherwise, sure, I cannot. Yeah. Go ahead. So the, the suffix property, that seems to depend on there being a single fixed point, right? Uh, and if there would be linear dynamics, that would be true, I think. But is it also true when you have nonlinear dynamics? Okay. Um, 
Well, when you have linear dynamics, it is easy to show. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so when you, when you have nonlinear dynamics, one, one simple thing that you can show um, is related to contractivity. So in practice, you can show that when your system is nonlinear, you impose some very strong assumptions that you can have, like for example, um, stability for every input mm -hmm. that you can show very easily with, in the case of nonlinear dynamics. When you go to linear, when you want to prove instead stability of input-driven reservoirs in nonlinear case, then there is, I mean, a lot of edge that comes into your mind, and I think that you still don't have a final final word on that. Um, I know there are some guys who are doing a lot of work, difficult work in, on this side. They are. Lorenzo Livi from Manitoba University. And um, I guess a guy called Manjunath in India. They are doing this from the dynamical system theory perspective. So uh, maybe I can provide a couple of references to the literature when they go more in depth. But a starting point, I don't know uh, if you are familiar with this concept. A starting point is the paper that I mentioned uh, regarding the acoustic property in the slides. So you can have a look at that. Um, because that when, you, when you go to nonlinear dynamics, you can prove only very strong assumptions that in practice are not, not so much useful. Right, and I have a, another question with relating to, to the, the ordering of, we only have like sequences. Is it possible to make it like order independent or is there a way to do that? So go in, the in that way, but if we have a set of things that we don't care about the order of them, is there a good way to, to encode that into the rest of our computer? So you mean in that case, you don't have a time series, but you have a lot of, let's say, a lot of vectors that, that, that are the, yeah, I mean, the, your input data. Well, actually, um, I would not do that, at least a fifth site. I would not do that because when, when I, I mean, this, this applies in general when you consider recurrent neural networks. If you, if you have, um, let's say, um, a temporal relation such that the information that I, that I, that, okay, if you can assume that you have a temporal relation in your, in your data or you assume that you see something after you see something else, Okay, this may the last one maybe could be true. Um, then fine, you, you could use that. But in general, it could be more difficult. Could be more difficult because there is a bias indeed that you are using the, the architectural bias that we are saying. So the Markovian bias affects the representation. So if, if when you see the last input data, um, you are affected by the one but last input data that you've seen. And this goes back in the past. So uh, you, yes, you might- The reason you, why I asked it in the first place was, hmm. I, I, I think that the Markovian thing would ruin it completely, but the graph thing that you've shown is sort of in that direction because the graph is, you know, uh, invariant to the, the, the order of the vertices, I guess. Yes, exactly. So in a sense, if your vectors are related to each other somehow, for example, you can even consider that all the all the all, all, all of your let's say vertices and every vertex is one of your input. Mm -hmm. uh, everything with everything is connected. Then you have fully connected graph. You can work like that. Yeah, in that case, you you could work, and it could I mean could be more mean, meaningful. Yes. Right. Yeah, I mean in that case, yes. At least if you if you want to say like I have a bag of vectors, all of these represents let's say my input information. And I know that they are all related to each other, but there is no temporal relation. Did I get it correctly? Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. So in that case, you can use a graph reservoir system to, uh, to, to, to represent that because you, have, you can represent your input information like a graph. Yes, exactly. Great. Yeah, that, that, that would be nice. So let me know in case you, you do something like that. Uh, Thanks.
other questions? Oh, one thing, guys. One thing that I didn't say. I, I'm happy to collaborate. So if if you if you are interested, in, uh, as you know, I, I, actually I'm running out of a lot of time. I mean, I, I don't I don't live anymore, but that's cool. But if you if you want to drop me a line, I'm happy to to communicate. Okay, to to discuss and to to collaborate uh, uh, as much as I can. So you heard him. Um, yeah, other questions? Otherwise we can close here, I think. Yeah, uh, okay. Then uh, I want to thank you again for uh, disponibility, <laughs> for availability and uh, two presentation two days in a row. Um, and uh, yeah, it has been really nice having you. Uh, I will publish the slides and the video sometime later. Uh, I will post on Twitter and on LinkedIn about that. So you, you should see it if, if, if you follow us and if you don't follow us. And uh, yeah, the next uh, meetup is on the 3rd of December, this time at 6 p.m. because we have uh, Sarah Hooker from Google Brain talking about the hardware lottery. So she, she sees, she, since she's in Pacific time, we are doing it a bit later to give their time to wake up properly, let's say. And uh, yeah, have a nice day, evening, depending on wherever you are. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys, for the invitation and for the nice, for the nice um, venue, OK? Yeah, thanks, thanks to you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.